I'm Bruce Lawson, and I work for Opera. I'm English, so I don't speak very good American, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, 350 million users. We make browsers for desktop, mobile, television, watches, in-car dashboards, etc. But that's enough about me. Let's talk about you. Specifically, where will your next customers come from? Almost certainly, they will come from within this circle. If only because there are more people living inside this circle than outside the circle. And at the moment, Asia is 4 billion people. The United Nations predicts that by 2050, that will be 5 billion. <clears throat> by 2050 as well, the population of Africa will double from 1 billion to 2 billion. And by 2100, a little bit late for me, the population of Africa will stabilize at 5 billion. Asia, of course, is home to some dynamo economies with great, huge populations and enormous economic growth. China, for example, with a 7.7% GDP growth. To get an idea of some of the numbers, Uber have one million shared taxi rides a day. Didi in China have five million. Black Friday and Cyber Monday in the US last year over the web netted 2.9 billion US. On 11-11 day, so November the 11th in China, e-commerce took 9.2 billion US. The Chinese economy is restructuring significantly. Instead of relying upon exports, they're now relying upon servicing their growing middle class. Indonesia is 250 million people, 5.8% GDP growth. It's the third most active nation on Twitter and the fourth most active nation on Facebook. Yet 75% of its population are still on 2G networks. And because of the geography, thousands of islands, 50% uh, of users report connectivity difficulties. Bangladesh. Bangladesh is often considered the, uh, the poor relation in the region. But in '93, it was the first South Asian country to adopt cellular technology. Household ownership of mobile phones was above 50% even in 2011. Myanmar. Myanmar has a whopping 13.6% GDP growth. Last year, the government uh, relaxed regulation. The price of a SIM card dropped from 2,000 US to $1.50. India, 1.2 billion people, the biggest democracy on the planet. 6.9% GDP. The number of internet users will double from 190 to 400 million in 2018, and the web will continue to contribute 200 billion US to GDP by 2020. Now, all these nations are growing fast. They all have a very young population, and young people are very uh, comfortable with the web, all except China, because of its one nation, uh, one child policy. But they also have lots in common with everybody else. Over the last 12 months, I've been looking at what different nations look at on the web. We can track these through the Opera servers. I need to point out that we can't track individuals. We can only track aggregates. <clears throat> so in the last 12 months, the U oh, everybody comes on smartphones, of course. Over the last 12 months, the top 10 domains visited by US visitors are search, social networking, Kittens on skateboards, that's YouTube. Uncensored information on Wikipedia. And the top 10 handsets used by the US are, as you'd expect, uh, high-end. The top 10 handsets, the top 10 domains in India are social networking, search, kittens on skateboards, uncensored information. Because India loves cricket, you've got Crick Buzz up there. But the same kind of domains, although the handsets used, are lower end. In Nigeria, search, social networking, uncensored information, kittens on skateboards, livescoreandgoal.com, because Nigeria likes football, not cricket. 
and the handsets are much lower end. <clears throat> but what this shows us is that wherever people are in the world, whatever technology they have, whatever their disposable income to acquire that technology, people want to consume the same kind of web. They want to consume the same goods and services, maybe your goods and services. So it's imperative that we make the web more performant on the lower spec devices that the next billion people will come with. This cake was uh, one eaten by my colleagues in opera to celebrate our 2048th change to the Chromium code base. Chromium is the rendering engine <coughs> that high-end opera browsers and Google Chrome use. The Chrome guys are focused on 60 frames per second, and so are we, but we're also working very hard to reduce the memory footprint of the browser, so it fits onto lower spec devices, to reduce the power consumption, so there are, are longer intervals between recharges, and to make it generally more performant on slower processes. Something else we're doing in the web standards community, so with the other browser vendors, is something called installable web apps. We know that the average smartphone user has 36 apps installed on her device. One in four are used daily, and one in four are never used. But those native apps can be tens of megabytes in size, so there's a lot of unused apps occupying a lot of storage space, which underspec phones lack. So what we're looking at doing is hosting the apps on the web, or you might call this a website, and then installing them by allowing them to be bookmarked to the home screen. <clears throat> so there's a new manifest format very lightweight, just JSON, just text, with information like, um, is it portrait, is it landscape, etc., And an icon. If the user chooses, she can save the icon to the home screen. Then when she clicks it, the browser starts up, but with no browser Chrome, full screen, so it looks indistinguishable from a native app. This is available now in Chrome for Android, very soon for Opera for Android, and its non-standard incarnation is available on Safari for iOS. And there's an article I wrote that you can go to. So what's great about this is that when the browser detects that a website is installable, it will offer this banner. This is a browser-produced banner inviting you to save it to the home screen. There's also a heuristic that requires that the user has shown uh, previous engagement with the site, so you don't get this on every site you visit uh, in transit. What's great for site owners is that if you have a native app and you make a change, you have to alert everybody that the app has changed and they have to download it. And in the emerging markets, where people are not always connected to Wi-Fi, there can be a significant time lag between your updating your app and the user getting it. But because it's a web app, the moment you make the change on your web server, everybody who goes there subsequently sees your change. Responsive images is something else we're working on as a web standards community. We all love sending huge product images that look beautiful on retina devices. But many low-spec uh, devices do not have retina screens because they're pricier. So we're sending huge images to low-spec devices that don't need those humid, huge images. And then those low-spec devices are using lots of CPU and therefore battery to compress those images down. So in 2011, I proposed on my blog a method of working out the capabilities of the browser and then sending the most appropriate image down to that browser. This has uh, manifested itself as some new HTML thingies, is the technical term. Um, it's, in, it's in Chrome, it's in Opera, it's in Firefox, it's partially in Safari iOS, and the Internet Explorer team are actively implementing this. It's vital because the average web page is now 2 megabytes. 1.3 meg are images. If you can make the images more performant, your website will load faster, people will visit it more, and your bosses or clients will erect a 40-foot statue of you in the car park. That's a guarantee. Affordability of access is, of course, the problem. 
In the rich countries, we pay between 1% and 2% of our monthly income for connectivity. In the emerging markets, they can pay up to 10%. So every megabyte you send unnecessarily eats their data plan and costs them lots of cash. So many people choose to use a proxy browser. Uh, I'm going to talk about Opera Mini because that's who I work for and that's what I know about. But other proxy browsers are available. There's QQ, UC, Puffin, and Microsoft Express, which they inherited from Nokia. Except last year, Nokia, uh, Microsoft signed a deal with Opera, us, to transition their 100 million Express users to Opera Mini during 2015. Now, the way all proxy browsers work is there is a very small, lightweight program that's on the phone. These were deliberately small because they were designed even to support uh, Java feature phones. And it's backed up by a, a server farm infrastructure. So, for example, when, you go to, when the user goes to example.com, that is rendered our servers because many really old devices cannot render web pages because they're so underpowered. Then we send a binary blob down to the phone, which is a pre-rendered, therefore compressed version. We call it OBML, Opera Binary Markup Language. And we found testing in India last month, Opera Mini, therefore, consumes on average 14% less battery and 89% less data compared to other mobile browsers. Consequently, we do lots of business, 120K transactions a second, 23 petabytes compressed last month. A petabyte is a gigantic number, to, to put it into perspective. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN uh, accumulates 30 petabytes of data annually. We compressed 23 petabytes last month. And so consequently, we have a big user base in exactly these up-and-coming countries that you will probably need to talk to to generate your next customers. Our servers are not in those territories. Apart from the Chinese server, which needs to be, be, be behind the firewall, we have a server in Iceland, which um, looks after India, one in Amsterdam, which deals with the ex-USSR and Europe, and East Coast America, which looks after Africa, and West Coast America, which looks after everybody else. <laughs> and this may be as counterintuitive because you always imagine that being closest to the server gets you better speed. But we don't find this because, like this truck I photographed in India a couple of years ago, emerging economies have grotesquely overloaded networks. We know that only a fraction of the cell towers in India have a fiber optic connection to the backbone, for example. So connections are very inconsistent. So what happens with us is your user in South Africa sends one request for a URL to our server farm on the East Coast. Then we talk to your website. I've drawn three arrows, but most web pages have about 60 different assets they need to fetch. So it's important that those 60 be close together and across fast networks. Then we send one binary blob back so that the chances of the connection dying is reduced. Now, Obviously, if you're designing for these markets, you need to know about them. Don't do this. In Thailand, if you write somebody's name in red, you are wishing them dead and therefore unlikely to do good business. In Indonesia, don't do this. Because many people, like my friend Putri, has one name. Her Twitter handle is only Putri. And if you require two names, she cannot sign up to your service. Also, be aware that there are technical constraints for proxy browsers. Everything happens on the server. Everything needs a user interaction. Everything needs a round trip to the server. JavaScript runs on load for five seconds and then is stopped to get the page and the content down to the user. Therefore, JavaScript-only APIs simply don't work. Also, design. CSS rounded corners and gradients are not rendered because we would have to make them to bitmaps, which would bloat the page. Animations show the first frame to conserve battery life. We don't use web fonts. These can be huge downloads for primarily aesthetic reasons. So we just don't. We also find that on low-spec devices, the system fonts are carefully optimized for that device, and we use those. So don't use icon fonts. Use SVG. 
That's what it's for, and you can make it responsive. The methodology you need is progressive enhancement. This is nothing new. This is how the web was designed to work. If you use something like Angular, which sends lots of JavaScript down to the de device, that's fine, but be aware you are potentially locking out hundreds of millions of users. Progressive enhancement isn't only great for proxy browsers, it's great for everybody. Uh, Airbnb were delighted with their Holy Grail app that looked exactly the same as the one it replaced, but the initial page load felt drastically quicker because we use real HTML instead of waiting for the client to download JavaScript. It's fully crawlable by search engines, and it feels five times faster, they said. The rise of the smartphones. Of course, smartphones have been going great guns lately. Unsurprisingly, the biggest consumers are the richest and the largest nations, but they're also hugely on the increase in the Middle East and Africa at the expense of feature phones. So a lot of people thought when feature phones started to go, the proxy browsers that were designed for feature phones would stop being used, but we haven't seen this. This is a list of devices you've probably never heard of. A hundred Android devices shipped with Opera Mini pre-installed in Nepal, Bangladesh, and India two years ago. The reason that people are still using proxy browsers on smart devices is because of Bruce's law of smartness. It doesn't matter how smart your phone is if your network is dumb. Connectivity is still an issue. Prices are coming down fast, but infrastructure doesn't get upgraded so fast. We know that less than 50% of the world lives within uh, the range of a 3G tower. Therefore, we're seeing 53% increase in Opera Mini users on Android, 130 million last year, um, outperforming the markets. It's also available on Windows Phone in beta and on iOS, and iOS it's for a different market, so we can press video too. What's next? Uh, we've never talked about this before, uh, but Velocity seems to be a good place for discussing it, and I beat up our legal department to let me. The last 10 years of Opera Mini have focused upon compression, because slow networks and underpowered phone phones were the problem we wanted to solve. The next 10 years, we'll be looking at compatibility, making sure that we show your websites as closely as possible to how you want them to be seen. That doesn't mean we've given up on compression. We've discovered that Bruce's law of smartness doesn't always apply. On smart devices, we can ask them to work a little bit harder to unpack the compressed format that we send. So we've been doing some tests. There's still a lot of optimization still to be done and a long time before this will be production ready. But by asking smart devices to do more, we reckon we can compress between 30 and 50% better in the future, which means faster websites. Because 94% of people offline are in the developing market. That is more customers for you, and it's more customers for us. And importantly for me personally, because underneath this preposterous hair and this silly suit, beats the heart of a Haight-Ashbury hippie. I think bringing the web to people is the right thing to do. For people who cannot afford a textbook, the web is a school. For people who have miles to walk to a doctor, the web can be frontline medical care. For people in repressive regimes, access to the web and access to people outside that is light in the darkness of a dictatorship. And that rhetoric aside, the web brings real material gains an increase in internet maturity, similar to the one that we've experienced in five years, brings an increase in GDP per capita of 500 US dollars. It took the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century 50 years to produce that same result. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>